For Creamer Media's Policy, I'm Sash Nimadli. Researcher and analyst Professor Raymond Sutner joins me today to discuss his book, Inside Apartheid's Prison. Welcome, Professor. Thanks a lot. What were some of the torture methods used on you, and how did your time at Durban Central compare with that to Pretoria Central and local? You see, um, uh, there's a number of ways of torture. Uh, what they like to do is to blindfold you, strip you, and then you don't know what's happening. And they put electric shocks, and they prefer doing it on the genitals. Mm. And uh, the pain is, you know, I can't remember how bad mm. it was, but it was very bad. But it's not so bad that I couldn't make any thinking about what I told them. Like I told them all about Joe Slovo, who was in London, mm. you see. I told them all about various things in other parts of the, and they'd say, tell the truth, man, tell the truth, man. Can I put the Kaffirs onto you, they said. They, in other words, they were threatening me that there's something worse than this, mm. and that is uh, black people. Like they mm. thought that their fear of black people mm. was my fear. And so electric shocks is one thing. Uh, and you're not supposed to be able to identify people because of that. Although I had an idea. Uh, before it started, it was like a bizarre <coughs> type of theatrical thing. Uh, at a certain point, the head of the security police, Colonel Stiencup, came in and he said something to me and then he twisted my nose. He left and then this Colonel Taylor, he was then warrant officer, came in wearing a butcher's uniform, mm. which, and then took off my glasses and he said to me very quietly, now we're going to teach you something. And then the torture started. Now, after it was finished, uh, I was putting on my clothes. I may have still had a, bl yeah, I still had a blindfold on. And one of them, I think he was Colonel Captain Dreyer then, he said, uh, I don't think you can put on your socks. Do you want me to put on? I said, yes, put on my socks. And then when I came out, see, a lot of this is theatrical. I'm still blindfolded. And when they took the blindfold off, I found myself handcuffed to an African who held a fist with a ring on it towards me. Mm. And then one of them came and said, made as if, leave him alone, and like took me away. Now, they play these games to make it seem that they've got nothing to do with it, mm. you see. So I then was taken into a room, and the, all these security police, I was going to say Boers, these Boers, you see, we, it means, it doesn't mean Afrikaners, it means English and Afrikaans speaking police or prison officials. They're all there, they've all, all got their feet on the table, I think, and then this tailor's there in a suit and he says, you're very rude having your feet on the table. Anyway, someone says something like, get him some breakfast, but I never got anything to eat. Mm. And then the interrogation resumed. And they kept on verbally abusing me, swearing at me, all sorts of things. And then later in the day, they took me to a Durban North police station. And they said to me, look, we want you now. Have a very good rest. And then uh, tomorrow morning, or you can feel much better and tell us everything. So I knew they're not going to leave me alone. Within a few minutes or an hour, there was this terrible shouting. You know, they, they know how to threaten you. Mm. Then they took me into some other part of the police headquarters and they made me stand uh, or crouch uh, with um, my hands stretched out and what they called my Bibles on my arms. That was some marks and some linen or something like mm. that. And then when I fell down, they pull me up by my hair or my beard, and uh, then when I kept on falling down, they put drawing pins there. 
frankly, I didn't care about drawing pins at the time. I was, uh, I was very, I wasn't as fit, very fit now. I wasn't so fit then, and I was getting tired. Anyway, they said, "Oh, you're tired," and then they made me lie down on a, on a table, but leaning up in a very uncomfortable position, and one of them threatens me with putting a bowl and putting a rat underneath it. The only way the rat can get out is to eating in my stomach. Mm. And some of, some of us didn't uh, take seriously. Mm. Um, or, you know, they threaten, say, they've got my mother there, they've arrested my sister. Mm. You know, I wouldn't um, fall for this stuff because I'd spoken to a lot of people who have been tortured. And I knew what their tricks were. So, in some senses, it was familiar for me, mm. even though I may have been the first white to have been given electric shocks, but I nevertheless knew about it because I'd spoken to African comrades. So that happened. Uh, then, the about a day later, they took me to the other offices that I'd been into before, and by that time, I, hadn't, I don't know how they did the electric shocks exactly, but my arm was very swollen up. And there's a guy called Kutsia who just grabbed me by where it was swollen. Mm -hmm. And he uh, said to me uh, that I must do this crouching again. And this Kutsia, you see, some of them look in a way that is enough to make you scared. Half of his ear had been bitten off by some criminal, I think. And, but he was like strong, like if he had hit me with his finger, I probably would have <laughs> fallen down. So, uh, but then it sort of tailed off. But they, then they came again, and then they took me to be questioned, because they thought I knew about people who were distributing pamphlets in Cape Town. I didn't know. Uh, and then uh, after this, they took me into the colonel's office and he threatened me. And I said to him, look, uh, you can start, or I may have said this a time before, you can start the electric shocks again. I'm not saying anything else. And he looked at me shocked as if I, he didn't, believe, didn't know what I'm talking about. Because mm. you see, they had this myth that the officers had nothing to do with it. They knew no nothing about it. But he made me sit on the floor and he said, because of the difference of age or something, and then he threatened me that he would use KGB methods. And um, I remember when I'm listening to this nonsense, I was looking at his bookshelf and he had all these confiscated Marx, Lenin, Engels. I thought to myself, yeah, I wish I could have some of these books, you know, what they wasted on him for. And then he says to one of the uh, other people, Fatima Vech, take him away. And um, I think I was more or less left alone then. But you know, you don't know, you don't know if you're left alone, because mm. you don't know when they're coming back. And um, they, kept me for six weeks before I was charged. So I was kept in solitary then and for another three and a half months in uh, the prison. Uh, now solitary, some people say, is a form of torture. I didn't think so, so much the first time round, uh, because even when I was convicted, I was in solitary again for another three and a half months. But in uh, the second time I was in, I started to realize that solitary is a form of torture. Mm. Now you were in prison with former political prisoner Tim Jenkin. Yes. Um, he escaped from Pretoria yes. making keys during yeah. his time there. Yeah. Um, how involved were you in this escape plan and how did his escape affect change in the prison? Yeah, well, you know, in the book I indicate that there was quite a lot of tension around this escape because although when in retrospect the escape was a victory, we felt, the majority of us felt, that escaping was a political decision mm. and that for it was very important that Dennis Goldberg should be amongst those, he was a Ravonia trialist, should have been amongst one of those who escaped. 
And um, we then agreed that all of us except Tony Holliday and John Matthews should escape because Tony Holliday and John Matthews were going to be released fairly soon. But then I went out once to something at Durban Central and I told them something about the guard system. And these three who escaped, Mumbaras, Lee and Jenkin, said, no, no, uh, it's best to go now. And they decided they would go, the three of them, not the rest of us. Uh, and Dennis Goldberg even helped them. He distracted the guard. The guard came to talk to Dennis and Jenkins was already out. These guys, like Tim Jenkins, were very, had a lot of ingenuity. I mean, we had more keys, I think, than the prison warders had. I had found clothes. There was a place, see, awaiting trial prisoners were near there. There was some place where they were throwing clothes, and I got those clothes. Now, I wasn't myself involved in uh, the escape in a big way, and I didn't agree with the, uh, I agreed with the principle, but I didn't agree with the decision that those three alone mm. should escape. Uh, in the annals of prison history, it's a victory. But as a, as a phenomenon, people like uh, Dennis Goldberg, myself, the late David Rapkin, uh, we were not uh, in support of the three going out. So when it happened, prison officials are, um, you know, they a bit like an ancient community after some disaster has occurred, they have a sort of ritual cleansing and you spend half the day cleaning this, washing that, polishing this. It's got nothing to do with the escape. Mm. But um, they were they were just I remember when the uh, when the when the warder opened <laughs> opened the, the door in the morning and found no one there, he calls Um Pit Um Pit says as uh, uh, sergeant or warrant officer Peter said, Call me so um pit and then they went to each of the doors and looked and they were just in a total panic. And there was this guy, General Rue, who was um, later became DG under Forster. He was a very um, calm, collected guy. He had a doctorate in psychology, but and he just he was cool about it. But we knew something was going to happen. Mm. Well, at first, they put in big mirrors in our cells so they could see whether we were there, um, and they searched us a lot and things like that. But prison warders, unlike the security police, have not got staying power. If they're ordered to search you, they search you for a day or two, but then they prefer to rest, you know, and close their eyes and things like this. But then we suddenly got moved. And I had been in maximum security before. That is the hanging jail. Mm. And all of us were moved there. That was now six, five, I can't remember. And um, the conditions were made much better than when I had been there on my own. This time they arranged for us to have music and the food was better than at um, maximum security. And what is quite nice about maximum security, I think it's safer for guarding the condemned is you don't have sh showers, you have baths. So, you know, I would have my bath at about three o'clock, relax in the bath, things like this. Uh, but the problem was that for exercises, you had to go for one kilometer, you had to go 32 times around the yard. And um, it's a terrible place, maximum security. You don't have you, you, you don't have access to the sky. There's like mesh wire above the small yard. Not even birds can get in mm. there. And you have, you have uh, on, the, on top there, you've got these warders uh, with their rifles. I remember once some warder tried to commit suicide or something, shot himself, and we just said, look, 
we want these guys who are shooting themselves just to make sure they don't shoot here, shoot down to us by mistake. And um, so we were, we were in there for, it's supposed to be a short time, we were in there for about three years, if I remember correctly, but it was much easier for me. I'd been there on my own the previous time, mm. and my own it was terrible, but it was still terrible with the others because it's not a prison with facilities for long-term prisoners. Uh, you know, what is long-term um, is, uh, people these days think three years is long-term. Uh, David, late David Kitson, used to refer to my sentence as a parking ticket. Um, so, you know, we had different ideas of what is long term. Mm. While we were there, uh, yeah, we were treated okay, but it was not, um, it was not, not easy. Then eventually we went back to the old prison and they changed it completely. No keys, it was automated, it was very difficult to escape from there. And there was no we previously had a yard with a garden, all mm -hmm. of this, all of that had gone. When you had a, um, when you were released from prison the first time, you went underground. Not immediately. Yeah. Uh, what was life like during this period? See, when I came out, I wasn't going to stay in the country initially uh, because the way in which a lot of people acted in the past, and before that, had been that they had been put under house arrest or heavy banning orders, so they couldn't do anything politically. So a lot of them got what was called an exit permit mm. because you didn't have a passport, you would leave the country, and um, that was it. Now, we sat in jail and we had only got newspapers in the 1980s, mm. but we came to the conclusion that under P.W. Boerter, things had changed there were certain openings and they took a decision that I must not leave the country, that I may not even be banned. And I was a bit scared about this because I thought I'm going to be arrested again. Mm. And of course that did happen. And I had been tortured. I didn't want to be tortured again. So I came out and I was fairly cautious and I uh, didn't get banned and I didn't get very heavily involved at first. Not because of fear so much as I didn't want to provoke a banning order, a restriction that is, because I was seeing people secretly. Mm. So I was underground in a way, but not, um, not totally underground. I was doing clandestine having clandestine meetings with people, or even meetings that were illegal, I would not make them public. I didn't go on platforms for a while. Um, and that was the period when the UDF emerged. And I didn't go down to the launch of the UDF in August 1983. And when I first got very publicly involved, I was invited to do the TB Davy Memorial Lecture in Cape Town. And <coughs> we discussed it, decided that there was this contestation over between black consciousness and people who believed in the Freedom Charter, mm -hmm. between people who were called workerists, who believed that class was the only thing, and the Freedom Charter. They believed that it was desirable that someone must go and give an interpretation of the Freedom Charter which would become hegemonic, that would become an authoritative interpretation. So I was invited about March, I spent months preparing for this. Now what's useful about the T.B. Davy Memorial Lecture is they publish it immediately as a booklet. And you know, that night that booklet was in Kimberley and all sorts of places because um, it was a carefully considered defense of the Freedom Charter or analysis of the Freedom Charter. But after that, it was impossible for me to be low profile. I was invited everywhere and then I got involved in the UDF. Now the UDF was not an organization, but a coordinating structure mm. for a number of affiliates. And um, I gradually got more and more in touch 
with what was happening in townships, and I worked with comrades from a number of uh, townships as well as uh, other communities. And um, in, the, in the course of 1984-85, the resistance got to be quite uh, powerful mm -hmm. with calls to make South Africa ungovernable and also for people's power. Now in this period, I met a lot of people and I went to a lot of these areas and I learned a lot about people's power. And I wrote a lot about it and I was involved uh, with Jeremy Cronin in this thing called Isizwe, the nation, which produced a lot of things for it. But all the time I was elected as a UDF education officer, was training people in political mm. uh, understandings and so forth. And uh, from listening to people, I had read about the role of the masses in history, but it was a set of words. But I saw what one can call mass creativity, or I heard about mass creativity. And I remember I did a lot of interviews with people where I learned about this. The present minister of la la rural development, Gugile Nkwinti, was a leading figure in Port Alfred. And Port Alfred had incredibly developed uh, organs of popular power. And why they were successful, why there were not any abuses like you heard of in other places, is they involved the whole community, women, students, youth, workers, etc. They didn't use violence. For example, <coughs> if there was a stay away, they would uh, and someone was trying to break it, there would be a little child in a tree who would say, Mama, why are you going to work? They wouldn't use violence and all of it because they'd worked out these structures. Mm. And the popular power period for me, and I was then an academic lawyer, was very interesting from the point of view of crime control, things like this. It was, um, it was difficult. You know, it was interesting and, and funny also. You know, I once went with Mohammed Valley down to KZN or somewhere else, and he said to me, you know, I don't know where there are uh, consumer boycotts, we're not. We went to buy some something. He says, make sure that everything that you buy is edible <laughs> because they may make you eat it, you know? And you know, they used to make people eat washing powder at some places. So that because you don't know, sometimes you go into uh, Beaufort West or some place like that, and you don't know that there's, um, there's a consumer boycott and then you've got a whole lot of goods bought from a store that you're supposed to boycott. Mm. And then they make you eat it. And then um, that is, in the places where there wasn't the discipline, where you don't use violence and all of that. So we uh, made sure that we had sweets and bread or what have you. And finally, you broke ranks with the ANC and the SACP. Can you tell us why? Well, you know, um, when I first wrote this book, I didn't imagine that I would ever break ranks because it was so much part of my life uh, if one thinks about it, uh, I know I, I know the children of some of these people. I've seen them as babies. I've seen gone to see them in hospital and um, things like that. So I've been to the weddings, and mm. uh, they, they, I was very close to a lot of people. So it was really, you know, they say ANC is a family, and that can have mafia connotations. But the notion of family is also uh, a mutually supportive thing. Now, um, what happened is when the Zuma started to emerge, personally I was not in agreement with Tabu and Becky, but I was not prepared to go and join up with anyone, especially someone who appeared to be involved in corrupt activities. Now, at mm. first, I didn't think it was the case because I was rather concerned that when the Shabir Sheikh trial was on, Zuma was not on charge, but they were showing his um, balance sheets on the TV every night. 
And I remember coming on an aeroplane and seeing Nkosazana Dlamini Zuma on the plane. And I said to her, you know, I'm really concerned about this, what it's like for the children to see this. She says, yeah. It's, she said to me, it's terrible because one of the kids is a journalism student. So I was, um, I was upset. You know, I, when I first met Zuma, I admired him and then I didn't admire him. But then when this happened, I was sympathetic. However, he started to present himself as being a man of the people. Mm. Now, I didn't believe he was that. And I believe that the Communist Party and the Kosatu and Youth League in promoting him as that were committing what they would call in the law of contract fraudulent misrepresentation. So um, I was unhappy then. But when the rape trial occurred, I felt that there was something incredibly cruel about the way uh, the woman who was called as uh, called Kwezi Fezeka Kuzwayo was pummeled in the witness box mm. and threatened outside, and nothing was done by the ANC, Zuma, or the Communist Party, or Kosatu to stop these threats. In fact, they came out of court every day and danced with Zuma, singing Mshini Wam, which means bring me my machine gun, which is a military, militaristic song, but the gun is also a phallic symbol. Mm. So I was very unhappy with this. And the Communist Party, uh, the Bladen Zimani wrote an article on Business Day. I wrote a low-key letter criticizing them. Uh, the Communist Party saying, how is it that we can condone this? And then instead of engaging with me, because I was a leader, even though I wasn't then on the Central Committee, they would get me to write things, present things. I was still very much involved. They got the youngsters, the Youth League and others, and the spokesperson to attack me, call me an armchair revolutionary, things like this. I wrote to the Communist Party Central Committee and I said, I'm not apologizing. However, these are my reasons for doing this. They never replied. I don't, I don't think the letter was ever presented to the Central Committee of the Communist Party. Now, I didn't resign from anything, but I didn't have a direct fallout with the ANC per se, although I was critical of them, till I attacked Mantashe in about 2008. And what was different on Mantashe? He asked to come and see us, he came to the house, and he said to me, he wants to hear my concerns. So I told him my concerns, you know, corruption, blah, 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 blah. Mm. And he says, but can't, you, can't we just have you come and meet with delegations and things like this? So I said, no, man, for all I know, you, you will put me in a delegation along with one of these crooks, you see. So I'm not prepared to. Mm. Uh, I can't. Uh, this, you people have got yourselves involved, not just with Zuma, the people who supported Zuma. And he said, look, all I ask then is the next time you're going to attack us, let me know in advance. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I thought with Mantashe, what I didn't have from the Communist Party, which I respect, is that Mantashe understood I was a person who'd been in the struggle for a long time. He took the trouble and the courtesy to come and see me, mm. to discuss it. We didn't agree, but he did try to make up. And most of these people I've not seen at all for over 10 years. I've not talked to, not communicated with. Uh, it's my choice, by mm. the way. Some, in some cases, it's their choice to uh, f try and have me excluded from certain things, but I don't want to communicate. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. That was researcher and analyst Professor Raymond Sattner discussing his book Inside Apartheid's Prison.